previously on Night of the Serpent. Heck parts the hanging greenery and steps into a new world. The city of Orlunga is not a ruin, but it is alive and vibrant and choked with people. He stands there, astonished for a moment, and then rushes back to tell his companions. The party experiments a little. Stepping into the city transports them into the past. Stepping out of the city returns them to the present. Buffered by the knowledge that they can return to the present, the heroes of Red Bazaar, as one, enter Oralunga. Oralunga is a pentagonal city, surrounded by misty mountains and jungled hills. The streets are a riot of noise and color, obviously in the middle of some sort of a raucous festival. When they first step over the threshold, there are thousands of people in sight, all Chultons, laughing and celebrating and shopping and singing. The city is full of great and amazing waterworks. Water wheels endlessly clack. Waterfalls trickle down the sides of buildings. Fountains are everywhere. At the center of the city stands an enormous ziggurat, a looming edifice of stone, the same one that appears nightly in Gulvive's dreams. In Gulvive's dream, that ziggurat was the only safe haven in a jungle thronging with undead, and at its summit was a red flashing light, like a beacon drawing her in. So that's the way that the party heads. To the citizens of Oralunga, the heroes of Red Bazaar are quite a sight. Vorn draws many eyes, but so does Thirteen, tabaxi unknown at this time on Chalton Shores. Gulvife is met with distrust and suspicion, and Heck, used to being fawned over by humans, is somewhat nonplussed when the Chaltons appear nonplussed by him, an ordinary Aarakocra. By Echo's reckoning, they are approximately 200 years in the past. Uptau is still dead, but Chult remains a thriving nation with a ruling monarchy and no undead horns ravaging the countryside. Eku also knows, however, that a terrible calamity began in Oralunga around this time. It was here that Rosnisi began his reign of terror, rolling over the city with an undead horde from nowhere. When they reach its foot, the ziggurat is a massive structure, tall as a mountain, blotting out the sun. Waterfalls cascade down its five sides, pouring from the open mouths of gigantic jaguar heads. Standing guard at each staircase, however, are two enormous warriors, the Bare. Ancient super paladins of Ubtau, they are eight feet tall, muscled like demigods, and all women. Amazons, basically. They do not let the party pass. According to the Barre, the Protector has given them explicit instructions that he is not to be disturbed. When all attempts to persuade them fail, heck reasons he'll simply fly to the top of the ziggurat and talk to the Protector himself. Then the Barre demonstrate their incredible leaping ability, jumping 30 feet in a single bound. Stymied, the group decides to learn what they can about where, and more specifically when, they are. By questioning the locals, the party learns a few important details. They learn that tonight is the Night of Serpents, a festival thrown to honor all of Ubtau's Kuwadals. At this time, the Kuwadals are all dead, along with Ubtau, devoured by the rapacious Dendar, and it makes Eku a little emotional to see all the feathered serpent decorations. They also learn, and overhear, that a parade is winding its way through the temple district. While most of the party goes to investigate, Heck flies overhead and surveys what he can of the city. The parade is a menagerie of beautiful sights. Dancers, revelers, musicians, flower petals that seem to rain endlessly from the sky, massive paper kowaddles that gamble through the streets. Among all the fun and games, however, they see a man in a cage, dragged through the streets like a trophy, like Vercingetorix through Rome. And this, they learn, is Rosnisi. They learn that he simply led a small cult in the hinterlands, a kidnapping here, a human sacrifice there, unpleasant stuff, but nowhere near on the scale of what he would eventually accomplish. Recently apprehended, it is the protector's decision what will happen to him now. High overhead, Heck discovers something odd. The higher he goes, the further he sees, and the further he sees, the hazier and blurrier everything becomes. While the city appears normal, the further he goes outside of the city, the less the world seems to render, in a sense. Like a character in a video game that runs up against the edge of the rendered world, he's left with a distinctly Truman Show vibe. Heck returns, just in time, to hear a familiar roar. His heart clenches in terror as an enormous bipedal dinosaur, the king in feathers, stomps around the corner. But it's only a parade float, meant to honor the fearsome beast. But Heck is surprised at his sudden and almost supernatural terror at seeing even this facsimile of his chosen foe. 
In the end, there's nothing for it. They must warn the Protector about Rosnisi's future. But as they leave the Temple District, they can't help but notice a small shrine, one of hundreds, one on each street corner, meant to commemorate the Kowadles. This one, they recognize after careful study, was meant to honor Eku. The Kowadle has nothing to say, lost in the memory of ancient days. It takes all of Thirteen's persuasive power, but they manage to grant the party an audience with the Protector. Escorted by the Barre, they climb the ziggurat and approach its summit. Behind velvet curtains, they encounter a fantastic beast. An enormous jaguar with cosmic intelligence glittering in its eyes, a pair of massive multicolored wings, and a host of snakes, thick as pythons, sprouting from its neck. As they approach, it pays no attention to them, and instead considers the sky through a massive domed skylight, and at that skylight's center is a ruby, an enormous ruby, several feet across, used as a magnifying lens. This is Nimbaza, they learn, the protector an ancient being, one that claims to have held dominion over this land before the coming of Ubtau, one that claims to have originated from somewhere beyond the stars. When the Maze Master defeated him, he granted Nimbaza reign over Oralunga, but by divine interdict forbade him ever to leave, making him prisoner and protector both. Now he watches the stars, awaiting the day when he might return. Yet the stars have shown Nimbaza a troubling sight. Something will happen, the stars tell him. Something terrible will happen. And it will happen today. Nimbaza is lost in these contemplations, and does not heed the party's warnings. It is Thirteen, with some help from Eku, who puts all these pieces together. Nimbaza, they realize, is dreaming. And they, this city, this festival, are all contained inside the Commandant's dream. The party realizes they must leave the city, re-enter the city, climb the ziggurat, and speak to Nimbaza in the present. Eku even offers to eat his dream and hopefully free him from this nightmare. In exchange, Nimbaza gives them a word. Yagra. A word that only he would know, and that will serve as a pass key to his trust. As the party crosses the city, heading back towards the gate, the celestial event that Nimbaza warned would happen, happens. Crowds of Chultons gather to watch as a comet arcs its way across the sky. Right as it's about to pass in front of the sun, however, it doesn't. Instead, it seems to strike the sun and fill the sun with a dark energy, blotting it out almost like an eclipse, turning the world purple and eldritch and wrong. The citizens, ooh and ah, thinking this is all part of the show, but the heroes have an inkling of what's about to come, and they book it for that gate. As they run, a smell overtakes them, a putrid, fetid stench, the smell of death, or more specifically, the smell of undeath, a smell that fills Gulvive's heart with terror. But they manage to make it to the gates, and as they push their way through, the ooing and awing of the people turns into screams. But then... They're through the gates. They're back in the familiar jungle. Behind them, Oralunga is nothing but a ruin, but it's a ruin they must cross in order to find Nimbaza at the top of his ziggurat and wake him up. And that's where we stopped. That's where we ended the session. So how did it go? Ah, it was really fun. It was really rewarding. These are my favorite kinds of sessions that are just like these giant sandboxes that are full of world building and lore and culture and, yeah, I mean, like fantasy, right? Uh, of course, the flip side of that means that that's a lot of prep that you have to do. And as is the nature with these things, right? Like they didn't see two thirds of the stuff that I prepped, but they, you know, they felt like they could have. Uh, they felt like they could go anywhere and see anything, and that's that's really the point. Anyone who's read Tomb of Annihilation will know that this is very different from the way that Oralunga is presented in the books. And I liked a lot of the pieces. There's a time travel component in the book, and there is like this all-knowing sage on top of the uh, the ziggurat. Um, and it's an overgrown city, so I liked all of that, but I wanted to sort of spin it in a way where it would work better for my campaign. I was pretty happy with the Barre, too. Uh, obviously, they're very different from how they're presented in FR. There's a lot more lore and history to them in FR. I just sort of needed something that would feel bigger and mythical and not really around anymore, and I liked these sort of big Amazonian super paladins. Uh, they have a lot of the same abilities as the Barre, like command and uh, regeneration, stuff like that, but I liked them sort of as this Kingsguard, almost. 
I also feel like this session helps solidify some history for the party. So 300 years ago, Uptau died, and then 200 years ago, Rosnisi appeared, and then 100 years ago, Rosnisi disappeared. And so you kind of have these different epochs, and so it's interesting to see them sort of like contextualize. Okay, where are we? We're in sort of the second epoch, where Uptau is dead, but Rosnisi's not gone, rampaging here, like right on the cusp of it. This is also the debut of a fear effect that I'm going to start to introduce. Basically, whenever one of the characters comes into contact, sort of IRL, with one of their fears that they've been having these nightmares about, they have to make a wisdom save against a a fear effect. Right now, it's pretty simple. It's pretty low DC, and the effect is just that they're frightened of it. But as the campaign goes on, of course, the DC will get higher, and the effects will become increasingly worse. That way, whenever Ghoulvife encounters Undead, or Heck encounters the King in Feathers, or (laughs) Thirteen encounters Water, it's going to eventually become a, a very challenging, potentially even sort of game-breakingly challenging problem they're going to have to get over. Oh, also, while we're on the topic, I really thought the float was another nice way to tease the king in feathers. Just like these tiny little morsels to uh, Jay until we can finally get to the point where we can actually face the creature in real combat. Probably won't happen until Omu, but you didn't hear that from me. Nabaza was inspired by the, I think Shanabaza is their name in the adventure, and they are a naga and like a sage. And so my version of them was inspired by that. I'm trying to do this thing with the Chaldean cities where each one of the nine trickster gods sort of has a, an appropriate city. And so I decided that the, to do sort of a sphinx-like sage, I wanted someone that felt very otherworldly and felt very beyond, you know, the the ken of the kinds of creatures they've seen so far. So I paired that up with the Commodon, which is the jaguar with the uh, the six uh, snakes. I felt like it was a good synergy there. He was also a little bit inspired by uh, the Tower of the Elephant, which is a Robert E. Howard Conan short story, uh, which Conan tries to rob this tower and steal this gem and encounters this otherworldly being at its summit, who's been imprisoned there by sort of forces beyond its control. The word that he gives them in the adventure, uh, Yagra, was my best recollection of the name of that being, which I've since looked up and is actually Yara. I think Yagra is like a mm, slightly better name than Yara. But that was my little nod to uh, Tower of the Elephant. It was actually Kay's idea Idea, and I rolled with it in the moment for the entire thing to be a dream. My thought was it was just like a memory that it was essentially Nabaza using his sort of Sphinx time magic to relive Groundhog Day style the same day over and over and over again and try to figure out like where he messed up. But he every time he like went back, he didn't remember that he had gone back. So he's in this like recursive loop over and over and over again. And it was Kay's idea of like, well, oh, it must be his dream. Like, oh, that's much better than my very complicated idea. So yes, it's his dream, and he's been put under by the dream plague, and he's been constantly reliving this thing over and over and over again. It was also their idea to have Eku eat the dream, so I'm really curious to see what's going to happen with that, and whether, I mean, how that's even going to work. Like, can she eat a Sphinx's dream? What is a Sphinx's dream like? We're going to have to find out. But no, it was a great session. It was a good reward, I think, for weeks and weeks of sort of pushing their way through the jungle. How do you think I ran the session? Do you have any questions about Tomb of Annihilation, the way that I'm running the campaign? How do you design a city? How much prep do you do beforehand? How much improv? What's important to you? What are the areas that you world build whenever you design a big urban area for your characters to explore? Tell me about it in the comments. I would love to hear. We'll be back next week with episode 15 of Night of the Serpent, and uh, we'll see what happens when they go into the ruined city of Oralunga. Until then, thanks for watching, and happy adventuring.